All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we, oddly enough, we were originally slated to go first, but I'm glad in the end that we got to go last because uh, a lot of what has come up across the day, across the afternoon here, um, is we're seeing a lot of repeating themes. And when we get to this topic, we're also seeing the same repeating themes. And that tells us a lot about what the issues really are with transportation in this country, not only in this country, but across the Caribbean. And why I say across the Caribbean is because uh, we in our group uh, yesterday, we had a, a rather broad cross section. We had a heavy Caribbean uh, presence. We had Barbados, we had Jamaica, we had St. Vincent, um, persons from those uh, islands in our group. So we, we took the frame a little wider in having the discussion, because one of the things that we discovered in talking is that a lot of these problems are the same across the board in the Caribbean. We have a lot more similarities than differences when it comes to transportation needs, transportation issues, transportation problems, and the, the issues are related to revitalizing towns for transportation. Um, so let me just... Uh, we pulled up, we, we had a, a long, a long list of issues really that we were uh, discussing, but in the end, it came down to three key issues that we found in our discussion. Uh, the issue of infrastructure and design, the issue of the entire policy cycle and I'll explain what that means when we get into it, and issues of uh, human factors and social equity. Um, I would just, uh, so in infrastructure and design, uh, we're talking about the creation of streets, public spaces, and urban aesthetics. And I'll let Anthony uh, take over at this point in time because you really got into this uh, section of the discussion with the participants. Thanks, Oniko. Can, can everyone hear me? Yes, hearing you fine. Okay, and I just switched my video on. Um, so I hope you can also see me. Um, Right. So as Onika mentioned, we had a very diverse group of participants in our discussion, in our group discussion. And so uh, for that reason, we uh, even though we're talking about revitalizing towns and, um, you know, this is a, a UE uh, St. Augustine forum, uh, we tried to keep it uh, place agnostic somewhat for the benefit of that diverse audience. So um, you know, initially, I'll, I'll just give you a little glimpse of what we had initially planned to do. Uh, we wanted to get a sense of, okay, what people's um, thoughts were when they think of um, a successful urban place or town. But then um, after we did that, uh, we were going to ask them to maybe look at a few visual examples of places in Trinidad and Tobago, you know, our main cities, Port of Spain, San Fernando, Chaguanas, Princess Town, Arima, the borough of Arima, et cetera. But, um, you know, as I said, I mentioned, it would not have, we, we wouldn't have been able to capture the widest um, and richest feedback from uh, our participants who were not uh, from Trinidad. So we kept it place agnostic. And actually the more we discussed is the more that we realized that even though, you know, each country is, is unique, um, we have a lot of commonalities across the region and even outside the region. So I uh, just wanted to, to uh, set the um, scene that way. Um, and so I think, you know, after listening to everyone else's presentations this afternoon, I've heard a lot that feeds into our own discussion and our own presentation. Um, and I would say uh, an overarching theme for, for our sub theme of revitalizing towns is really, uh, is two things, a post COVID um, scenario or, or a post COVID world and uh, climate change because you know, when you think of revitalizing towns, this is sort of a, a loaded term. It, it implies that, okay, a town or a city is, is somehow underperforming or, um, or outright failing or just could benefit from some sort of improvement, right? Um, and so, you know, we asked our participants to really, you know, approach it that way um, and then also weave in or, or look at this uh, issue with a transportation lens. So um, without further ado, I'll just get into the infrastructure piece. Um, so we clearly identified that, you know, a lot of infrastructure is, uh, you know, today is built 
in a sort of an isolated fashion. You know, the, we have traffic here, we, you know, let's build an interchange or let's build another lane. And all of us here in this forum know that we cannot build our way out of traffic congestion. And we have fully given over ourselves to the car um, as sort of a, the, the pinnacle of, of um, circulation and movement in our cities. And yes, it is a preferred mode of transport, but is it always the best? Is it always the most efficient? Um, and is it, always, um, is it always the most accessible for, to everyone? Um, and I would argue that it is not. So, um, so the infrastructure that is being developed, um, you know, is it really benefiting everyone from an equity standpoint? And is it really, um, how are we thinking about the infrastructure? Is it really being done in a comprehensive manner that, okay, we're gonna invest a few hundred million dollars or, or maybe billions. How is this piece of infrastructure going to serve our needs for today? And looking forward again, climate change and post COVID, you know, we have, uh, if we're looking at future proofing our cities for sea level rise, more intense storms, all that stuff, we need to start making our infrastructure more um, multi purpose. So, if parks double as swales or spillover regions for rivers that run through our cities or, or cities that border the ocean, um, you know, our, do our highways have bicycle lanes? next to them that, that are only gonna add um, a fraction of the cost to allow another, an entirely other mode of transportation uh, for those who choose to, to travel. So and it encourages that other alternative form of transportation. So this, this first point uh, led to you know, the solution of thinking, how can we think bigger about our infrastructure and who needs to be at the table to really inform the discussion so that the, the, when we spend the money, the money is working, the dollars are working, twice as hard, three times as hard, five times as hard, so that we get the maximum ROI on this piece of urban infrastructure. Um, and so, you know, the key stakeholders, you can see them there. I, I won't bore you with, with reading it off, um, which, and I'll just jump into point two, um, quantitative and qualitative data um, collection. So right now, as a previous group mentioned, you know, or maybe previous groups, we do not do adequate nearly <laughs> enough data collection, if at all. So do we have the data there to collect? Um, do we have the means of collecting it? And we had a robust discussion about this to say, do we have, um, you know, is data collection really a very uh, cost burden exercise or is it something that is attainable with the resources that, that we have? And so we discussed uh, low cost data collection and, you know, higher cost. And, you know, as someone else mentioned, maybe we use the lower cost approaches uh, to make our observations and under, first of all, understand what, what we are measuring, use those lower cost um, uh, interventions to then maybe inform a deeper dive into research that allows us to, um, you know, spend a bit more money and dedicate that to getting more deeper insights to then inform, okay, how do we spend these millions of dollars, right? Um, and so we need to commission uh, data collection, better data collection, so that you know we are you know we're operating from a point of, of empirical research and and data driven insights. You know the rest of the world is already moving in that direction. Different sectors within our country have, have fully embraced a, a data driven approach, um, and urban planning and transportation is no different. Um, so, you know, I've, I've heard of, of the real-time data or real-time analytics. I've lived in places where, you know, I just open an app and I see I have like at least six options to calculate, okay, am I going to walk? Am I going to take a bus? Am I going to take an Uber or Lyft, you know, or a train? We need to be able to have these options in the Caribbean. So um, same list of stakeholders, I would say, including the CSO um, and uh, data scientists and analysts. And, you know, look local first because the local people have their skills. They've either been trained here or abroad and, and have come back. Um, and, you know, they will also have the benefit of the local uh, context of, okay, they've lived in their country of, of origin. So they know the place better than a foreigner would. Um, the next point I'd like to talk about is green transportation, right? So we had um, one of our participants from Barbados talk. Uh, he, was a, he was a champion for uh, uh, weaving to get using disused assets uh, in the form of, a, of an old train line in Barbados 
that uh, I guess weaved its way through several neighborhoods. And he was saying, oh, this, you know, similar to, you know, the High Line in New York City or, or the Belt Line in Atlanta or, or any other urban infrastructure used to carry goods from point A to point B can now be, you know, used for uh, maybe some sort of active transportation or recreational purpose. Because again, in a post-COVID world, you know, we've seen the trend of employers in mostly white collar jobs saying, hey, look, we have the ability for you to work from home. You can choose to do that indefinitely or at least till, you know, 2022, our cities are gonna have less people in them, less footfall, less cars traveling into them. How are we going to embrace or, or, or manage this, this, this new change? Because a lot of people are going to want to, to do that and they like that work-life balance. So then our cities, which are already sort of, they sort of die out at 5 p.m. in the Caribbean, um, except for the certain entertainment districts, they're, they're gonna suffer even more, right? So how do we make sure that our cities are still remain attractive, um, vibrant, safe? Because less eyes on the street means, you know, possibly means uh, more dangerous streets, you know? Um, so th there's a crime uh, element that needs to be looked at as well. So by designing green um, infrastructure that encourages active transport, be it walking, be it cycling, be it women pushing strollers or men pushing strollers, um, walking your dogs, whatever it is, um, you know, a different uses of the city, I think that will also feed into um, just having a more revitalized space. Um, also, I want to mention just the design of the streetscape itself, you know, is it optimized for our climate, you know, so, you know, we have very hot sunny days and then we also have the rainy season, which can bring strong afternoon thunder showers. So, you know, do we have those sheltered um, sort of, of um, cantilevered um, walkways, you know, for, for people to really use, you know, uh, to choose over driving in a private vehicle, right? Um, we also heard about using EVs or AFEs, alternative fuel uh, vehicles. And, you know, to the extent that there is a, a gradual adoption of those, we would love to see more of those uh, or incentives being given to, to those within the city so that we could uh, reduce our carbon um, emissions within the city, have cleaner air, which again um, ties back into the active transportation element, um, which will encourage just greater usage of the city and, you know, um, and just foster a better all around environment. And, you know, again, we're, we're looking at, okay, mostly behavior change. So again, there are low, lower cost uh, interventions and higher cost interventions. You know, we talk about tactical urbanism. How can we change signage? How can we change uh, repaint streets or sidewalks to really kind of make people think or think differently? You know, Apple says think different. So um, these are the lower cost uh, interventions that we can try or test first before we go and spend the hundreds of thousands, millions to, you know, re redo facades or streets or street signs or whatever it is, um, or, or, you know. Um, and then finally, um, all of this obviously costs money, as I said, but again, going back to the lower cost feeds into higher cost. Um, you know, I know of a very popular Danish um, designer who has a thriving practice consulting for governments all over the world. And he has a very qualitative approach. He just sits and observes uh, urban spaces and then you know, sees how, who uses the space, how they use it, when they use it, why they use it. And all of this information is then taken in back to their, their studios and they analyze it. And then they bring in their, their analysts, their data scientists to have, again, a qualitative and quantitative data-driven approach. Um, but anyway, all of this costs money and uh, you know, we can go to this, this um, you know, I think once we, once we can paint a, a clear picture that says this level of investment will yield this much in environmental benefits, in economic benefits and in social benefits, I think that can make, that can sell, be sold to the public and to the elected officials um, in order to get, you know, a better outcome. So at this point, I think I've talked enough and I will pass it along to uh, Onika. All right, thanks, Anthony. Um, so that's a, that's a look at to, in terms of the issue of infrastructure. Um, now we're moving on to the issue of the policy cycle and that uh, is referring to 
the development and implementation of policies, plans, strategies, and actual urban management. So um, in terms of looking at this, again, this is issues that are happening all over the Caribbean. We have uh, policy interventions that uh, practitioners in government maybe will want to implement or policy interventions that are, you know, that are desired by the public, but they aren't championed at the governmental and political level, which is something that, uh, again, see all over the Caribbean. And without that political championing, uh, that whatever needs to happen is not going to happen. Uh, so one of the solutions for that that we came up, um, the group came up with, we just have to engage and lock in the appropriate champions right at the beginning of the entire policy cycle. So at the visioning phase, we have to get the persons who need to be involved in the process at a political level, at a governmental level on board, um, not just on board, but enthusiastic. Uh, so that's one of the, that's the first uh, real issue. Um, the issues of data have come up over and over today and uh, here it's no different. Data is not driving our policy cycles in the Caribbean. Um, we don't collect data, we don't utilize data. We, and when this, in this frame, we're not just talking about numbers and, and figures and quantitative data, but we are also talking about, as Anthony would have mentioned, the data of observation, the data of public opinion, the data of uh, experience, because that's another thing that we don't, uh, we have a, a, a phrase in transportation called windshield perspective. So when we're talking about uh, persons doing uh, policy and uh, planning for transportation and, and, and urban, urban transportation infrastructure, urban revitalization, those things. We're talking a lot of the times about people who have windshield perspective. They are not utilizing the other elements of the urban space. And so they don't see them almost. So that is a form of data within itself, that experiential, uh, that experience of utilizing the city. Um, so definitely one of the solutions there is that governments, and we talk about central and local governments in this regard, commissioning and supporting research and data gathering on these policy and management needs. Um, and with the stakeholders that involves, as I said, central and local governments, uh, practitioners in government or tell us technocrats who have who are and have been in government, um, utilizing the university and its research capabilities uh, through faculty and students to really get into these thorny issues and figuring out like what works and what doesn't work. Another issue that came to the forefront is consultation. Consultation is a dirty word in Trinidad and Tobago, and I assume it is across the other islands of the Caribbean as well, because of some of the ways that we do consultation in the, um, in the policy space. Uh, stakeholders often feel as though they are the last step and they're just being told to check a box or to fulfill a need before you move on and do whatever it is that you want anyway. Uh, so the strategies and approaches that we use for consultation with stakeholders and the public needs change. We need to consider new ways of, of approaching the public to get support and buy-in for uh, policy interventions in the urban revitalization space. We have to do things like encouraging the formation of citizen groups involved with professionals to create lobbies that can lobby governments, which can also feed into the first our problem, which is that these implementations and interventions are not championed by the, the political things. One thing politician responds, one thing politicians respond to is public pressure. And if you can create that public pressure, a ground swell of opinion, politicians do actually listen. So that's uh, something, that's a that's a, a, a solution that came up as in part of the discussion. We also talked about the structure of our governance of our urban management agencies, particularly. The, our urban management agencies often are sort of hindered in two ways. One, they don't have the legal authority or autonomy to, to properly plan and manage certain aspects of the urban space. And so they don't, uh, they simply then don't see it as their responsibility and they don't see it as their need to get involved. Um, in some instances. For example, 
uh, taking the example of Port of Spain, Port of Spain City Corporation is responsible for roads and streets in the city of Port of Spain. However, the Ministry of Works and Transport sort of supersedes and is on top of that. And then you also have the Ministry of Local Government superseding on top of that. And their policy requirements or their policy uh, priorities take precedence over what the city might want to prioritize. So in terms of the actual changes or, or things that the that policies and plans that might want that the city might want to develop or, or implement they simply don't have priority at the governmental level they don't have authority authority they don't have autonomy they have to wait or beg or whatever is required to get things done so that is a, another issue that is that is faced across the Caribbean again we saw that come up in uh, the Barbados examples and the St. Vincent's example, we saw that come up as well. Um, with regard to the final problem in this particular area that we looked at, um, of course, as Anthony mentioned again, all these things, whenever you do things, they have to be paid for. And uh, so in order for them to be paid for, because our urban management agencies, our local governments are not strong and they're not um, autonomous and they are not autonomously financed, they must seek buy-in and financing from central governments in order to drive their policy cycle. And what that means is that we are sort of at the mercy of the political cycle. And when governments change, as we all know, everything changes, things get upended, things get disrupted, things that we're in train fall apart. That's something that happens again across the Caribbean. So one of the suggestions that came up in a group is like, well, you know, we have to collaborate um, with stakeholders, including uh, governments, opposition, politicians, just kind of and building those lobbies again, as I would have mentioned earlier, to create that groundswell of support for policies and plans and budgets and financing and all of those things. So that when uh, administrations or governments change, things don't die on the vine. Um, and so we're looking again at building lobbies and building collaborative efforts with central and local governments, with practitioners, with neighborhoods, with businesses, with civil society, in order to really drive these processes and ensure that they are continued. Because that is another, again, that is, that is an issue. Sometimes you get something going and it's moving and you're like, right, we're finally going to be able to do this. And then it just gets just dropped. So those are some of the things that came up when we were talking about the whole idea of the policies and strategies and management and all those things of the, uh, of the urban space. So now I'm going to let uh, Renelle take over and she's going to discuss the third uh, aspect, the third issue that came up in our discussion, which is human factors and social equity, which is ensuring beneficial outcomes for all users of the city in the revitalization process. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, during our discussions yesterday, as Anika mentioned, many um, different social factors, many human factors, issues of social equity related to the revit revitalization of town were the focus of our discussion. Um, we really felt as if, as urban practitioners, we don't just examine these issues. These are key things that we need to consider to ensure that we reach the broadest cross-section of people when we are initiating urban redevelopment projects and we ensure that there are positive outcomes to these people as well. So delving deeper into some of the issues that we identified, there were four main ones. There are many others that we can look at, but these are the four main ones. And um, we actually tried to put these issues in the context of COVID-19 and the pandemic, with, um, the pand pandemic re response. What we really found is that COVID has really, is really a period of volatility, a period of uncertainty, but all it has really served to do is to highlight that these are key issues to consider when we think about our urban futures in Trinidad and Tobago and also the wider, um, the wider Caribbean. So the first issue are issues related to when we are actually initiating urban redevelopment projects, how do we ensure that we don't just create winners and losers, that we ensure that issues such as the informal economy are considered within these projects. Secondly, we also looked at the issue of displaced persons. Someone asked the question yesterday, if you are a homeless person, what, what do you do? 
when you have to shelter in place. So really, this is a continued issue, which we see in our, in our cities, but it's something that we really do need to pay more attention to. Now, we understand it's not something easy. There's not a magic bullet that we can do to address this issue. But we, we felt as if some of the strategies that our municipal governments have put in place um, tend to want to push these people to the side to make them less visible within the public space. So we try to think of ways in which we can um, Look at, look at this issue differently. The third issue that we would have looked at would be the, the lack of alignment between agencies involved in social development and agencies involved in municipal development. If you look at some of the strategies of um, social development um, agencies within the country, they typically, they could typically collaborate with some of the finance agencies. They may go to the municipal government to get information. Um, however, when we look at the, the ways in which urban development agencies, such as Town and Country Planning or the HEC, they develop their strategies, they tend to talk to some of the infrastructural agencies. They talk to the WASAs, they talk to the Ministry of Works. And what we really see is that this, the, there is an overlapping sphere of influence between both sets of parties, and they really need to start to come together more within the urban development process. And while we try to address some of these social issues in, within the city, and finally, we would have looked at the issue of accessibility or rather inaccessibility within the city. So those are such things such as how do you navigate the city? How easy it is for you as a person on foot to go throughout the city? As a disabled, as a disabled um, person, is there even a pavement or a sidewalk for you to use? As a woman who may have many different bags that you need to carry around, you are maybe a little bit poorer, you either don't have a car or choose not to use a car. How do you do your shopping and access to different services within the city? And that also goes back to the theme of social equity and inequity and making sure that the city is, um, is able to support the widest cross section of people um, to, to, to do the things that they need to do within our towns and our urban centers. So I'm going to spend a bit of time on the solutions that we came up with. So when we go going back to the issue of equity, we try to think of the policy process again. So when you are coming up with urban redevelopment projects or master plans for different areas, um, typically you approach that process in a, in a way where you, you look at the space and maybe in a two-dimensional, then in a three-dimensional way, um, you set up different land uses. Um, you try to determine what are the densities that you need. However, is there a way at the same time to ensure that you also put in place mitigation strategies within that, within that, um, within that plan, within that master plan? For instance, one thing that um, someone suggested, perhaps within these plans, we need to um, create opportunity areas. Now, an opportunity area can mean many different things, um, but specifically, we looked at if we identify some of the poorest areas within the city, and if we looked at um, spending a particular sum of money in one part of the area, maybe on business development, you have to match that same spending within your opportunity areas. So those are targeted areas where you really concentrate resources alongside some of the other urban development activities you may want to do. Um, another solution that we looked at to address the issue of homelessness, homelessness would be to kind of meld some of the urban and some of the social programs. Uh, one thing that we considered is that maybe we, maybe one of the, the strategies that we need to implement in Trinidad is a housing first approach. So that essentially means when you are looking to address a homeless individual, a displaced person um, that is on the streets, the first thing that you try to do is actually put them into housing. You don't put them into a shelter, you don't run them from the public space, you don't arrest them, which are all things that happen in Trinidad and Tobago. But the first thing that you try to do is really provide them with housing. Um, another, um, another, there are several other models that we can explore, but we felt as if, if both sets of parties, the urban development and the social development groups came together, that um, we would actually be able to delve in, in depth into more um, models of addressing these, these, um, these kinds of issues. Um, another strategy that we looked at would be a whole of government approach to social inclusion. Um, we suggested a social inclusion policy. Now, this is not another policy document that we put on the shelf, but it's something that's actually integrated within the budgeting process in Trinidad and Tobago, and even the budgeting process in other islands of the Caribbean. 
So to get funding, you as a municipal government need to attach a social inclusion policy with your funding proposal. That policy is maybe a couple of pages. It really states your intents in terms of social object objectives. Um, it, shows, it shows how within municipal works, you will ensure that you um, include some of these social inc um, inclusion issues. Um, when you are um, devising new projects or devising new proposals, that you really state your, your targets in terms of consultation and how you will consult. And then when we move to the end of the financial year, this is the same document that they use to actually judge the performance of these agencies. So we don't just assess agencies in terms of how much they spend at the end of the financial year. We assess them in terms of how far they have gone towards implementing and um, executing their social in, um, inclusion policies. Mm -hmm. And the final area that we would have looked at would be the issue of universal de design. So I would have mentioned earlier the need to um, ensure that disabled persons are accommodated to the same city. Quite a bit of work would have been done maybe about six or seven years ago within this within the sphere. However, it wasn't actually implemented, implemented across many agencies. So one suggestion that we had is that perhaps we can work with academia to de um, develop some designs for um, some, some model designs for universal design. And then we train the persons who actually do go out and do municipal works. And these are the actual things that when they conduct their works, these are the designs that they use. Um, and finally, we looked at um, visual communication within the city, whether that's maps, whether that's information booklets, whether it's signage, you work with the arts community to try to understand how people process information and make it easier for people to understand how the city works, how to navigate the city and how to access different social programs within the city. So in essence, when we were wrapping up, wrapping up our discussions, we felt as if, you know, the city is really a generative place. Um, it really has a big impact on the ways in which people um, live their lives, the ways in which people experience places. Um, but it's really something that's also very difficult to, um, to, to, to break those chains, to break those patterns of the ways in which things work in cities. So we really felt that governance was one of governance and policy and strategies was one of the key ways in which we need to address those human factors, address those social and equity issues within the city. So I will just toss it back to, Kat, to Onika and she will wrap up for our um, group. Oh, yeah, just very quickly. Um, I so in terms of looking at revitalizing towns, I know it looks like we looked like a lot of I looked at a lot of things outside of transportation. But one of the things that we always have to remember is transportation is a derived demand. It's related to everything else that we do in the spaces in which transportation is moving through and moving to. And so when we look at transportation in the context of the urban space, we have to look at a number of other factors that go along with it. So um, just wrapping up here, you see that we we kind of looked at key problems, and these are the kinds of things that really look like they are across the entire sector, across all the sub themes. These things keep coming up: lack of available data, inconsistency of support and funding, lack of integrated approaches, and then see some of the solutions that keep coming up again and again: collaborative approaches, consensus building, support for research, repurposing existing resources, and low cost interventions. So these. These are really the, the types of things that we're looking at um, in both in urban, in the urban space, in the transportation space, and in the, in the nexus between the two. So thank you all very much. I know we've gone a little bit over and we'll take any questions, I guess, in the plenary. Well, we'll take some questions right now specifically, um, just one or two, um, and then we're going to jump into the plenary. Um, question. Um, uh, many EU cities are revitalized by making them car free and instead and greening them, having farmers markets, space for art. Um, is that an option, I think, for our cities in Trinidad? And um, you know, how would that link to the investment in public transport and parking rights and stuff like that? Oh, yes, absolutely. And we, we would have some, in, during the presentation, we would have spoken a little bit about uh, things like opportunity areas and low emission zones. Now, those are the kinds of things you're talking about opportunity areas. Could be something like creating public space for a market maybe, or uh, creating a, a, a part of the city that is a, perhaps a, an arts district or something like that. It's a zone which is 
utilized for a particular purpose and creates opportunities for persons who are living within the city who to use the city in, a, in, a, in a, an effective way for them. Um, and then looking at things, as I mentioned, like low, uh, low emission zones, which is uh, something that they've done to great effect, I think, in London. They created a ULEZ where basically if you are not utilizing a low emission vehicle or a no emission vehicle, you are either, I can't, I can't remember if it's that they're, they're paying a premium to enter the zone if you're not utilizing a low emission uh, method of transportation. So that is uh, some, those are some of the things that could definitely I think could apply. And in terms of the, looking at how these uh, interventions are financed and what the, the policy direction towards them in, it really requires us to take a completely different approach, I think, to transportation policy. Our transportation policy is just so heavily infrastructure focused. It's focused so heavily on construction. It does not, it, well, everything else kind of falls by the wayside or is like a, considered a, a lower priority than this heavy spend infrastructural, uh, this heavy spend infrastructural focus. I always in practice, my thing is what can we not build rather than what can we build? That's the question I always ask. How can we avoid building something here and still get what we want? And that is, uh, I think the, the approach that we need to start taking in, uh, in urban transportation and transportation for cities. Well, from that perspective, one contributor said, um, in terms of equity, government should stop subsidizing fuel and instead spend the money on public transport. I'm not going to get any arguments from me there, although the government has largely stopped subsidizing fuel at this point. Most fuels are now unsubsidized. I think there's still a small subsidy on diesel, but the government has largely stopped uh, subsidizing uh, fuels at this point, but what hasn't been done is, so is the subsidization of public transport. The fuel subsidy was the main subsidy that public transport operators in Trinidad and Tobago had access to. And without that, they don't really have a mechanism for encouraging public transport use because there's no differentiation really. Um, so there might be room, for example, to have a differentiated fuel subsidy, for example, where public transport uh, operators get fuels at a, a lower cost, for example, utilizing some kind of uh, um, electronic payments mechanism or something, um, whereas uh, private car owners would pay full cost, that kind of thing. So it's not a question of just removing the subsidy. We could also look at things like differentiated subsidies that to help push that general movement along. Yeah, but should, wouldn't government say that they do in fact subsidize public transport? The, pub, the, trans, the subsidy to PTSC is about $400 million a year, and then they subsidize the water taxi. So, you know. Well, uh, if, we, if we look at the, the ROI on those subsidies, I wonder what we're getting. It's not a lot. Um, we're talking about maybe 400, as you mentioned, $400 million a year to PTSC and about $100 million a year to the water taxi service. And in terms of outcomes, what we're getting is very little actual passenger lift, very little actual passenger movement coming out of those two. Um, the water taxi subsidy per passenger is something like $95 a trip. Whereas a PTSC, it ranges anywhere from, I think, uh, I think we're subsidizing something like 90% of uh, passenger trips because the fare box recovery is about somewhere between, it's somewhere between 10 and 30% is the fare box recovery for PTSC, which is extremely low. Yeah, in fact, it's about $35 per trip. Mm -hmm. um, the thing about fare box recovery, though, is that, you know, you, you can make a decision if you want to subsidize the passenger. But the passenger subsidy there is about thirty-five dollars a trip, and um, you know, and one has to ask: if producer subsidies are the best way to go, as opposed to the user subsidies, because who's really gaining from that hundred um, dollars a, a trip that is subsidized to the water taxi, and who's gaining from that thirty-five dollars a trip that is subsidized to the PTSC passenger? I uh, would argue, or sorry, I would just say that I would argue that producer subsidies incentivize operators to focus on the wrong things. The producer subsidies incentivize operators to focus on who is providing the money, which is the government and not necessarily the users. So the kinds of things that they can maybe do or consider doing, they wouldn't consider doing because it would upset their main provider financing. Yeah. One last question on before we go into plenary in terms of revitalizing towns. Um, uh, there's a statement and then a question. Um, 
the parliament policy, you, you mentioned putting pressure on the politicians, um, but uh, the parliament politicians is why they, when they do respond to public pressure, they may rush to implement only short term solutions or solutions that may turn out to be appropriate, inappropriate. Um, case in point is whether or not the, the, the moves to quote unquote regularize the pH um, in response to the public pressure. Um, are, are, are those the kind of consequences of, of politicians trying to rush to implement solutions? Well, this is where really the role of practitioners come in because public pressure is one thing, but informed public pressure is something else. So as practitioners, I think we have a responsibility both on the side of uh, helping to shape the public pressure, what it looks like, um, and also helping to help politicians, helping politicians navigate what the response to an effective response to that public pressure is. Um, there's a quote I always used to, I always used to say it's by Henry Ford. And uh, if he he's saying, uh, if I had ever asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. So in terms of that, you know, that's just a, a way of saying you have to help shape the you take people's needs into consideration and your role as a practitioner is to turn that into policy or, or plans or whatever that are useful and effective for what they actually want to achieve. Thanks a lot, Onika. And thank you so much, Onika, Anthony, and Renel for um, tackling a huge topic in terms of revitalizing towns and, and really doing it a tremendous amount of justice. And folks, that brings us to the end of the presentations. We now we're going to show, we have some other questions that we were not able to touch. So we're gonna go into that now in plenary session. And um, I'm just gonna throw out some of these questions. Feel free to add your other questions to the chat. Um, you, you would have noticed, I hope, and um, there's uh, some common threads running through um, a lot of the presentations, although they were on different um, themes. And um, be very happy to get your ideas as in terms of, um, so many other issues you have to deal with and perhaps the ways forward. And also a reminder to you to um, do give us feedback on your experience over the last three days in the symposium. We would love your feedback by place. There's a link in the chat for that. Um, I will start by, um, by asking my panelists just to perhaps um, respond to this statement made by one of the, uh, our participants. The biggest problem in the attitude to cars is that our decision makers drive cars. Starting in the 1960s, we began to sell the American suburban dream as a way to go with a car in every garage. We have never moved from this vision as an ideal and our decision makers see things that way. Windscreen perspective. Any other panelists can jump in. <laughs> That's um, it, it's, I guess it's inherited from our um, colonial, former colonial rulers who did a lot of predict and provide. So if you needed an extra lane, you just build it. And um, I guess it's a task for us as um, practitioners to educate um, the, the powers that be that um, times have moved on from predict and provide to um, predict and manage. So as Onika said, we don't need to, we need to question whether we need to predict and provide, which is predict and build, and look at how we could do predict and make best use of what we have instead. I think it's just an education um, situation, an awareness of, a greater awareness of the impact of the decisions that they make. Okay, we're well, speaking of the impact of the decisions you make. Here's a question. With um, limited um, gas reserves and the need to import gas, is it the best use of CNG to burn it in congested traffic? Hi, Kutus here. I think I answered that actually uh, on the chat. Um, about 15,000 vehicles use right now about 1.5 million stomach cubic feet per day of gas. The production of natural gas in Trinidad and Tobago is 3,600 thereabouts right now, million stomach cubic feet per day. 
the electrical sector by itself is using 250 million semiconductors cubic per day. So what we're talking about is a very, very minute amount of natural gas. And I think we were estimated at some point in time, if all the cars in Trinidad and Tobago were to use natural gas for CNG, it will probably be equal to the capacity of one of the large chemical plants in Point Lisa. So it really is in context a small amount. And at the end of the day, yes, it's a fossil fuel, but it's still the cleanest fossil, fossil fuel that we have. So I don't know if that adds, if that answers the question. The answer is it's minuscule. Thanks a lot, Curtis. Yeah. So that in fact is, is a matter of your scale, as you say. Dr. Okay, Thompson, can I jump, can I go back to the question about the politicians? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. About politicians driving cars. So I it rem the question reminded me of a certain prime minister that when got when he got stuck in traffic, right, in his in his entourage with the car, he decided to drive on the sidewalk, on the on the shoulder, on the shoulder, excuse me, in order to make progress, right? So I think the 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 attitude really does need to change because that that really should not happen, clearly. It's against the law too. But I think what we can do as you know people in the sector is is kind of learn from what we know, even regular customers experience, which is you don't really think that some mode of transport that you've never tried is a good one. All right, there's a good research showing that unless you've sampled it, you've tried it, you just think, oh, it's too much trouble, it's too much work, you know, I can't deal with that. So maybe what we should be doing is and you know, giving some examples of what good mobility, good mass transportation feels like to decision makers, to the politicians, to the ministers of X, Y, Z, all of them and other leaders, have them experience that this is possible in this country so that they see the world differently, hopefully. And then it's easier when we have programs and projects that are scientifically based that they'll be on board. Just a suggestion. That's a great idea, Amran, thank you. Um... And interestingly enough, we had done some work in terms of, um, I think Leah had done some work there. In fact, she wrote, a, she, she wrote up on it in the transportation blog. As you know, we have a transportation symposium blog attached to our departmental website. And um, one of the things we picked up on um, that Leah reported on was the perception of, of auto users on travel time and costs um, by public transit is far different than what is act what is actually what is actually is, and you're quite right. People people who don't use public transit don't really know what it, what the reality is. In fact, many people don't even they can't even perceive of themselves when we ask them if you didn't have your car, what would you do? And they couldn't perceive of themselves um, having an alternative way of traveling. And, 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 and that is something which I think requires a considered um, national effort to, to address in that context. Um, let me segue a little bit into to some road safety questions, um, which is a valid one, I think, for, for, for the road safety team. It seems as a lot of emphasis is being placed on the education, children and drivers and stuff, but humans are flawed and accidents will happen. What about the issue of forgiven design in terms of um, designing the infrastructure and the assumption that humans will make mistakes. How important is it to do that? Um, now keep in mind the issues that were raised uh, were raised within the group um, and we, we had a limited amount of time so we really couldn't touch on everything um, but definitely uh, uh, roads must be forgiving at the end of the day it is human nature to, to make mistakes. Um, and just because you make a mistake, it does not mean it should cost you your life or your livelihood for that matter. You know, um, it's something that, that we need to consider, especially as uh, roadways are being expanded. Are we taking all the necessary steps to ensure that as those roadways are being ex expanded, uh, that the necessary steps are being taken to make those roads forgiving uh, and prevent loss of life or, or, or severe injury. Uh, something as simple as, as considering the, the distance a, a light pole is from the roadway. 
uh, the type of light poles that you use, the type of utility poles that are being used. Uh, uh, I know that there are, um, there are some designs with utility poles that are designed to snap and reduce the, the force of impact. Uh, all of that is, is tied into making roads uh, more forgiving. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I know I know that um, that has been one of the, the key elements in terms of the the thrust towards um, having zero fatalities. That is your forgiven roads and forgiven highways. And the I know that the ministry actually has been doing some work. They have a lot of work to do in terms of maintenance of the barriers, because a barrier which is damaged becomes very unforgiving in terms of its ability to, you know, uh, minimize injury in case of a crash. Um, so let me, let me ask a question, which is um, perhaps for Lisi to answer. A couple of years ago or so, the speed limit on certain highways in Trinidad was changed from 80 kilometers per hour to 100 kilometers per hour. Was there any change in terms of the size of funds of the signage, et cetera, um, you know? Or was none, that, none that I am aware of. Um, I will even argue that even for the uh, at the 80 kilometer per hour speed limit, um, just give me a second here. Yes, even at the 80 kilometer per hour speed limit, even there there was some there are there were some questions rather as to how um, applicable the font size um, was to the um, prevailing speed limit. Um, having worked in another jurisdiction, lived and worked in another jurisdiction, I would have seen the differences between our signage, our standard signage for um, even the main road signs and the, the, uh, the then 80 kilometer per hour signs. And there are differences. Um, what they would have accepted as the minimum font size and configuration for these signs um, would not have, um, our minimum standards or our standards would not have met those standards. So even at the 80 kilometer per hour um, speed limit, at then I don't think that the sign, the, that the font on, on the, the size of the font on the signage would have actually met that. But I hasten to say that again, everything is relative. Um, having not done any scientific work with respect to driver's response to the signage, you know what I'm saying here is basically anecdotal. Um, on the other hand, in the particular jurisdiction, they would have done a series of tests and a number of data collection studies. I actually worked on one in relation to the addition of new types of signs um, as to the impact on driver response and, and safety on, on the whole. So if I were to compare the two, I would say that, um, first of all, there I don't think I, there's no research that I've seen that relates to the suitability of the signs based on the new posted speed limits. Um, and I'll take it also take it further to say that at the previous um, speed limit, I'm not too sure how um, applicable they were back then. Yeah, and if I can perhaps add for my, my, I don't know if anybody from the high risk division of pure is with us at this stage, but from my experience when I was in highway design, um, the design speed of those highways would have been in the vicinity of 120 kilometers per hour. And the signage um, in terms of the size of the font should have been consistent with the design speed. So that the move from 80 to 100 in terms of the legal speed limit should have still allowed your signage to be appropriate for the design speed of the highway. Um, it is very important when we implement speed limits that the speed limits do not exceed the design speed of the roadways. And I can give an example because this is something that both Arrival Arrival and, our, and ourselves at the university advocated very strongly against. And that was the increase in the speed limits of the roads along around the Queen's Park Savannah. When that speed limit was increased from 60 to 50, from 50 to 65 kilometers per hour, we indicated that the design speed again of that road system is not it is it is 50 kilometers per hour in terms of the radius of curvature of the corners in terms of the width of the lanes in terms of the usage of the roads in terms of the kind of activities we have a number of schools we have a zoo we have a playground the queen's park savannah tremendous amount of pedestrian activity 
and we advocated very strongly against increasing the, and, and in terms of what it would do in terms of improving travel time is minuscule. And we advocated very strongly against increasing the speed limit from 50 to 65 kilometers per hour, but that advocacy was, uh, was ignored. And um, that is very unfortunate because we are supposed to be working towards safer roads and in to increase the speed limit on a, what is essentially an urban road that is so multi-purpose. Um, I'm not sure who was being served by it. Somebody wanted to get somewhere in a hurry and, and that's what it did, I guess. So th those are some issues that we have to deal with in terms of our situation. Um, one last question and then we will be go to our wrap up. And the, the question really comes to the case of um, how do we how do we move forward in attempting to get more advocacy on behalf of the changes necessary for the development of the transportation system? We've talked about it in four different areas. Um, but what what do you see? And in fact, I'm gonna ask that question of all the panelists. And you can answer one by one. Um, what do you see as the next steps in moving forward? I mean, we've spent three days discussing these things. We've had tremendous participation. Um, I can't answer all the questions, but we will answer them eventually. But where do, how, what do you see as a way forward in terms of the advocacy that we have done thus far? If you're not out to the panelists, you can answer one by one. Well, I guess I'll go first. Um... It's always great to sit among practitioners and talk to each other and learn from each other and sort of set the stage for the kinds of things that we want to do. But what we are doing quite often is not reaching the public and the public is really where it needs to go because the public are the people who need to, in the end, they need to advocate for this and they need to be able to, they need to have the language to advocate for it. They need to understand what they're advocating for. They need to be able to create that groundswell that we haven't been able to get as practitioners to actually see some of these things happen. So in terms of our communications with the public and our public our public advocacy work as practitioners, I think that's the, the next direction that, we're, that we have to go in. Arrival Life has done a great amount of work uh, in this regard. They have utilized a lot of different uh, differentiated strategies for engaging the public on this kind of thing. And now I think that they could provide some really good models for helping us look at other issues in the transportation space and creating those public lobbies and communicating with the public and then educating the public on how to ask for these things, how to demand these things from the gov from their governments and their politicians. Thanks, Abika. Um, any other moderators, um, presenters, Brian? Yes, thank you. So I think, um, so I made a couple of comments at the end of my presentation, but I think bringing in others that are not only the, the, the as just as Anika said, right? Bringing in others that are not, you know, commonly exposed to the transportation issues is important. A key thing there, I think, would be what we, what we try to encourage them to demand of their leaders, right? Because, you know, they will see the things that they feel on a daily basis, you know, congestion and, you know, um, inability to get where they need to go and, you know, stress and pressure, whatever it is, right? So they wouldn't see things as we've laid them out in this symposium, but all these things clearly are important. And as, as was repeated, they're underlying elements to all of them. So I think when we're communicating, there should be simple messages that are, again, are scientifically sound based on what we've heard over the last three days. And they're very clear, this is important. You know, for instance, that could be the importance of having overall management of the transportation sector, a separate body that just does that, you know, and we've done that in the past, but it needs to be consistent because it's the only way it's going to get through, right? Generate that interest from the ground level. And also, let's be respectful for the politicians who, you know, we know that they have difficult jobs, but they need to be communicated in a very different way. So we reach out to them also. And I think at the same time, we can do small pilot projects that show that change is possible. But I think people already are very, um, you know, resistant. They, they, they accept that, okay, traffic is what it is. You know, life is what it is. Nothing will change. So I think we need to communicate that change is possible to those two groups and demonstrate it 
by having small pilot projects that could be self-contained within a community or some small group that already has interest in this, for instance, the active cyclists, for instance, right? So once you do those three elements and others that I'm sure other moderators will talk about, I think we can make progress. But we also have to manage our expectations because these things do take a lot of time. Even in those countries that we use as examples, they, they took decades to get to the state where they are now and where we can you know, look at them and say, look at what they have done. That's how I see it. Thanks. Um, Catherine? Yeah, I agree 100% with um, um, Ryan and Onika's statement, but what I wanted to add to that is, is two things. That it would be useful for the findings of this symposium to be packaged in such a way that um, low-hanging fruits is this phrase we have thrown around a lot, or easily and quickly um, implemented projects can be um, put in place, as Ryan has suggested, um, but they should be packaged in a way that is palatable to the politicians. Um, I also want us to not to forget the importance of behavior change and how we, we, uh, how we uh, achieve a behavior change that definitely needs to be, to be looked at because we are practitioners, we are all very experienced and qualified professionals in our own rights. So we see that things could change, but um, we're very, very small group among, you know, a million and a half people who are, um, you know, feeling very low and feeling like nothing good ever happens. So there's that to overcome as well. Thanks, thanks Catherine. Bria? Yeah, I would like to link up with Ryan's comments. Um, I could only say that, um, Producing a child needs uh, two persons, but bringing up a child needs a whole village. And sharing my experience from my pilot study, which I'm carrying out in um, Tobago, where I, um, where I was the facilitator for the community to produce their own sustainable um, transport plans, I, um, I realized that I think this is what, um, from my perspective as a researcher and um, showing the university is, is more needed, that we, we leave our university, um, we leave our positions to be the parents or the father or the mother of an idea and, and keep pondering around with our, our, our idea and hoping that it will become big. I think we have to go out and we need the whole village to let ideas grow. And um, so we have a very active role in this. Uh, yeah, I think this is, um, this is, done too little here. There is still these, um, there are us and there are the others. There are we and the politicians. There are we and the farmers or the simple people or people who, and I think this does not work. We simply live in one space and we, we, we create our space. That's it. Thanks, Julia. Um, Jerome. So, I mean, I'm going to more or less reiterate uh, what uh, my, my fellow moderators and panelists uh, had said before. Uh, I think um, we have to do a lot of work in terms of educating the general public. Um, I'm also very, very eager to see what's going to happen um, with the, the minister talking about uh, revitalizing the the, the the road safety council um and i think i don't know if it was it, it, it was part of your plan dr townsend or if it is just kismet um but i, I think it's it's a uh, perfect timing perfect timing to to pass that that information the results uh, uh everything that we've put together here this symposium uh, i think is the ideal time to to send that forward um as an, an advocacy agency, um, you know, we'll keep, keep uh, pounding it in, uh, both for the general public, because uh, the, the man on the street needs to understand uh, uh, the importance of some of these things that, that need to be implemented uh, and how it benefits them uh, in the same way that they need to understand that to put that, that pressure on uh, the decision makers. Thanks a lot, Jerome. And in fact, we, we were happy to find out that your, 
that this symposium schedule coincided with the UN Road Safety Awareness Week. Yes, it was, a, and, and we were happy to a partner to, to highlight that. Um, I, I, I see that some of my first day presenters are still with us. I'm gonna invite them if they wanna make any final comments. I'm so happy for them to be happy with us. Uh, so Lisi and Curtis and I think Selena might be sitting here and Maria. Any final words to us? Hi. <laughs> yes, I think one of the things that over the years I've started uh, advocating is that actually you get um, people to first experience the change and wanting the change, and then they demand it from their politicians. So I've, I've spent a long time, I think I spent nine years working for politicians you get some results, but you don't get the big results. So I think the big results come from bottom up, from the grassroots. So the more you work with, with the communities, the more you increase their awareness, I think the, the more successful you can be. And we started um, the big sort of the strong advocacy over the last few years, really, when it comes to cycling, for example, and walking, it has only been in, in, in recent years. And the, the first ever major protest, for example, was held, I think, two years ago now. So we're not talking of a long time here either. Um, but it was a start. And as, as Dr. Allard said, it takes time. Um, but it has certainly been far more successful if it's um, bottom up, for sure. Studies help, but people listen more to people than to professors <laughs> sometimes. That's all, Maria. Thank you so much. Um, Kutis? Uh, hi. Hi again. Uh, um, I, think, I think transportation in Toronto Tobago is at a point of crisis. If it's not there, it's very close to it. And, you know, some people say you need to find these solutions for a crisis, but sometimes the cure for a crisis is actually a much larger crisis or crises. And, and I, think, I think we headed in that direction. This is not to be pessimistic, it's to be realistic. Um, the country can't afford certain subsidies anymore. And I think, I, I think that fact is going to condition what happens to transportation. The country will start to have some significant limitations and they have already with respect to roadway and investment to accommodate a large uh, amount of private vehicles. I think that's going to cause um, some adjustments. So, so even though we have a crisis, um, I, I think the ingredients are there for us in our transition, recognizing these things. And it, a lot of it came out, I think, in this particular forum and, and, the, and the different fora that we'd have had within it. So um, in a nutshell, the, 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 the motivations for correcting what we have Almost all of them are there right now and add to that the context of having things cleaner and there are solutions from a technological point of view that, are, that, that really right now they are bound. I think that's going to form policy in Toronto and Tobago and we have to start making decisions around, yes, we might have to spend some more money here, but it actually works out in the long run because overall it's a, it's a lower cost prospect for Trinidad and Tobago. So I, I think, I think I think we will see some solutions. Um, I'm, 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 even though I started off pessimistic, I am optimistic that um, we will evolve into the correct place we wanted to go. That was just my contribution. Thank you, Curtis. And Lacey, final word from you. Okay, so in a nutshell, I would just say we need to go deeper and to continue what we are doing um, from a road safety perspective. Um, over the last decade, there has been um, several with, or there have been several strides made in terms of um, things, if you look at road fatality reduction and so on. But there's a lot of work to be done with, um, you know, whether it's with the NGOs like Arrival Live, law enforcement, um, the, the researchers, etc. I think there's a lot to be done, a lot to be accomplished. But at the same time, we should um, be optimistic of what can, what can take place. Um, again, we have achieved a lot. Um, there are a lot of new professionals or young professionals coming into the transportation realm. So I encourage you as you listen here to play your part, get involved because, you know, um, more hands make the work lighter. So 
um, the more voices we have, the more advocates we have, the more people doing serious work, I think we can achieve a lot more. And it goes across not just the safety, um, the safety stream, but for all of the other um, sub um, subgroups represented here, even with you know the drive towards green energy, for example, we need to, to continue advocating. We need to not give up. Yes, we may things may appear despondent sometimes. Um, sometimes it may appear that people aren't listening. But um, you know, if you look at how a child grows, if you are a parent or a child, you know, you never see the the incremental growth. But with you know, millimeter by millimeter, inch by inch, you know, five years down the road, somebody didn't see them. They ask, you know, how you get so big. And it's, it's the same thing with us. I mean, bit by bit, we may not appear to be making progress, but again, you know, if you can half a death rate in the space of a decade, yes, it's good work, but we need to continue the drive towards, um, um, you know, growth in the sector and across all of the sectors and getting um, our ultimate goals achieved. Thanks a lot, Lacey. So folks, this, this brings us to the end of the Transportation Symposium 2021. Certainly, I would like, on behalf of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, to thank you for participating. Um, we've had tremendous response. We have over 230 people who registered. Um, yesterday, we had a, about 70 people who were in the workshop, and we have over 90 people today. So there is a tremendous amount of participation and interest. I want to thank you for it. I want to thank the presenters of the one who really set the tone. Um, Professor Equi for his welcoming remarks. Um, Ms. Um, Cheryl Bennett Innes, who really put a perspective of a one Caribbean, one region, one many islands, same problem, and she really did that for us on day one. And then we had Professor Mark Raymond from the University of Johannesburg, who um, gave us the issues on revitalizing towns. Um, Mr. Lacey Williams, who touched on the road transport safety issues. Um, Mrs. Selena Mohammed Wilson, um, consultant out of Jamaica who um, gave us the issues that we must consider for private sector participation in public transportation. Um, Mr. Curtis Mohammed, um, our green transport solutions specialist and who um, stayed with us for, for, for the entire period, this is um, and Curtis. And um, in particular, I want to thank Professor uh, Maria Atad way over there in Malta, in the night, in the dark of night in Malta, but she stayed with us throughout and she gave tremendous support and information um, on the role of ITS in future mobility and um, gave her experience and it's particularly important coming from a small island state um, who shared many of the sort of problems there. I wanna thank my moderators. Um, you saw some of them today. Um, in revitalizing towns, you, you saw, saw and heard from Monica Morris Allen, who's um, also one of our PhD candidates at UE, um, Renelle Sargent and Anthony Bridgman um, Water. Um, in road transport safety, we had Jerome Skinner from Arrive Alive. Dr. Lee, behind the scenes with Jerome was Dr. Lee Leon, who's a um, lecturer in civil engineering, and Rika Rampit, who's one of our research assistants and um, two candidates. In the private sector participation, um, we had um, Ms. Catherine Agong, who's another one of our PhD candidates and research assistant, and um, Mildred Bonio, who worked with her, and Mildred is one of our recent MSc grads. She's done some interesting work in the area of um, mapping the traffic, the taxi network, and indexing the, the state of public transport in Port of Spain. And it's going to be published in some in, in region or short while, so I'm, I'm, I'm letting you know where it comes out. Um, um, in green transport, we had <laughs> Ryan, Dr. Ryan Alad, and, um, you heard a, a, a lot from him and his team. His team were um, supported by um, Dr. Portia Fierce, one of our recent um, PhD graduates in civil engineering, and um, Shani Braffitt, who is one of our PhD candidates as well, and who came to assist us with the um, administration. Thank you very much. And ITS in Future Mobility, we had Dr. Julia Kotsidu, who we have adopted. I don't know if she's going to go back to Germany. Maybe she, she won't be able to. Um, but she has really been working with us in the last few months. And um, she was assisted by Kohan Dulce, who's one of our MSc graduates. And she, her area of specialty and interest in sustainability and transport. And again, we have some publications that we should be seeing in read just now with, from Kohan. 
And those moderators worked very hard to, to, to make yesterday happen and to make today happen. And it would not have happened without them. I want to thank them so much. I want to thank the presenters. And it would be remiss of me if I do not thank the team from marketing and communication, Josanne Green and Chanel Gasco, who taught us all we needed to know, um, calmed our fears, managed us, um, dealt with our ignorance very calmly and very <laughs> easily um, and really made this symposium happen. It has been um, the brainchild of our planning team. I want to thank other members of our planning team in particular, um, research assistant, PhD candidate, Leah Wright. You have not heard much from Leah, but Leah has been essentially the driving force behind the administration of this. Um, and also Roger McLean, who's one of our, our colleagues from across campus, um, Health Services Unit, sorry, Health Education Unit, um, and Dr. Philbert Morris, who's one of our um, lecturers, part-time lecturers and consultants to us in the transportation area. Um, I hope I have not left out anybody. If, not, if, if I have, I'm sorry, but I think that I've covered most of my colleagues who would have been involved in this. We really look forward to continuing the process. We will be planning how to do that. We will make sure that our proceedings are available. And um, we also continue to solicit your views, your ideas on how we could push forward the agenda. I think we are all interested in the same result, a, a safe, efficient transportation system for Trinidad and Tobago. And it is only through our collective effort that we are going to get there. So that um, once again, thank you for everyone for your participation and for your contribution. And we look forward to keep, you know, keep in contact with you. Make sure you put your um, comments and make sure you put your, your um, feedback on our form. And we will see you again shortly. Thank you very much and have a good and safe day, everyone. Bye for now.